scripture today is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. Isaiah 11, 1 through 10. Before we start reading, let's pray. Holy God, let the words of my mouth, the meditations in each of our hearts, bring you glory, praise, honor, and majesty. Through the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and in the power of your Spirit. Amen. Isaiah 11, written 700 years before Christ. Out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance nor make a decision based on hearsay. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. The earth will shake at the force of his word and one breath from his mouth will destroy the wicked. He will wear righteousness like a belt and truth like a, an undergarment. In that day, the wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion. And a little child will lead them all. <coughs> the cow will graze near the bear. The cub and the calf will lie down together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. The baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, a little child will put its hand in a nest of deadly snakes without harm. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. In that day, the heir to David's throne will be a banner of salvation to all the world. The nations will rally to him. And the land where he lives will be a glorious place. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. A stump sprout is the analogy that Isaiah used, that the Lord tells Isaiah to use, as an analogy for the coming Messiah. It's kind of strange that it would be a, a stump sprout. Now, in the forestry world, back, uh, I don't know, 20 some odd years ago, there was a, in our society, there was this conversion from newspapers and reading. It started going electronic, right? And we started getting computers in our workplaces and in our homes and printers, and we needed white paper instead of newsprint, right? So it just this, this thing happened in the late 80s where the paper mills and the paper industry was trying to catch up with what was happening in the world and to be able to produce white paper, you know, great nice paper that you could print, you know, not newsprint, which is a lower grade paper, which uses pine pulp wood to make the newsprint. Well, it had to change to hardwood, which, you know, makes the white paper. It's predominantly hardwood. So the forestry world was trying to figure out down in this pine area, like the piney woods uh, of East Texas and, and Northwest Florida and South Alabama and all that where I was at, all right, how do we make the shift from growing pine trees to growing hardwood trees? I mean, it, it was not something we really were, were adept at. We'd never done that, so we had to make a change. And, and what we discovered after trial and error and, and was the best way to reproduce hardwood, we, we actually had to look at Brazil. The way they grow eucalyptus in Brazil is they plant them originally, and in four or five years, the trees are 50, 60 feet tall. <laughs> now, they cut them, 
and let them sprout back from the stump. They don't replant them. They use the same root system and let the sprouts come back from the stump. And they jump up because they've got a great root system already established. They're already there pulling up nutrients to feed a 60-foot tall tree. And there's nothing there. So, I mean, boom. You talk about getting some pretty quick uh, growth. So that's what we started doing in forestry in, uh, in the hardwood was uh, letting stump sprout. It's called coppice. Coppice forest, which is a stump sprout forest. So it's kind of neat that, uh, that they use this analogy for, for the, the Messiah who, well, if you will, the Lord kind of had to deal with the line of David too because there was a bunch of unrighteous kings that came after David. Even David fell, if you'll recall, with Bathsheba and all that. And then Solomon would end up falling and, and, and getting becoming, well, not so committed to the Lord. And then his heirs after him would just turn away from God completely and it ended up, you know, the Lord would had to uh, have other nations come in and conquer them and haul some of them off into captivity. I mean, it went so... God kind of deals with all that unrighteousness by saying, I'm starting over, but I'm coming, coming with this, this, this foundation, which is the Jewish people. I'm not forsaking them. I'm going to be faithful even though they have been unfaithful. So God takes this, this, this establishment of the Hebrew people and brings this Messiah in the line of David But if you notice, God is faithful. Look at this. In, in, in Matthew 1, talking about the lineage of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who is this stump sprout, talks about Salmon was the father of Boaz. This is the line of Jesus. Boaz, whose mother was Rahab the harlot, who was a Gentile and a prostitute. Jesus came from from her line. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Ruth was a Gentile. She was a foreigner. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. And Bathsheba and David, you know, it was a little uh, hanky-panky going on there originally. But God overlooked all that and he used it anyway because he said, I am faithful in spite of their brokenness. I will use them. And, and as Jesus comes on the scene, he's born a Hebrew, right? Dies a Hebrew. He proclaims the good news to the Hebrew people. The root, if you will. And, and, and even after he is raised from the dead and Paul goes out and begins to preach, he preaches first in the synagogues to the Jewish people. All right? So, so he started with that foundation and that's where it takes off from. That platform of the Jewish people is where the gospel of Jesus Christ begins and spreads like wildfire to us. All right? Let's see what we got there. There's the stuff sprout. All right. One more. Uh, all right. This may be kind of weird. <laughs> weird picture. Uh, in, this, in this world that we live in, just not unlike the, the, what's happened to the, to the Hebrew people uh, in, after David and all, uh, we live in a broken world, y'all. I mean, it's, it's all around us. We can't escape it, try as we might. But God is still working in this broken world. It's almost as if we are, we are swimming in it. It's everywhere, the brokenness, the, the, the frailty. But if we, if we seek God, we're like a synchronized swimmer. God will still use us. And he's trying to bring glory to himself. And it's something beautiful to see. Even though we may be swimming in, in a world that, that has all kinds of difficulties, trials, and tribulations, 
God's beauty can still shine in and through His people, through the righteous acts of God. 2 Chronicles 16.9 says, The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. God will take us, use us, bring glory to Himself through us. And it's a beautiful thing to see. This guy named Ladiba who was from South Africa, an African who was raised a Methodist Christian in Methodist Christian boarding schools and, and, and came to say as he was being educated that he saw this. He saw that the church was as concerned with the world, this world as the next. And he saw that virtually all of the achievements that Africans had made seemed to have come about through the missionary work of the church. As a result, Nelson Mandela began to proclaim the good news about Jesus Christ in Sunday schools in the villages around about where he lived. He became disenfranchised with the government, the, the white government that was oppressing the people. And he began to be a part of the revolution that was, that was fighting against it. In 1962, he was arrested for being a, a revolutionary. And he was sentenced to life in prison. He served 27 years, y'all, in prison. And in 1990, because there was a, an uproar from the international community, as, as the, uh, the white government began to, to break apart, Nelson Mandela was released. And, and he partnered with de Klerk, who was the, the then president, the white president of South Africa, to bring about peace in that nation, to bring about the end to apartheid. As a result, in 1993, he was given the Nobel Prize for peace. And in 1994, he would be elected the first black president of South Africa. And the rest is history. God used Nelson Mandela. He can use you and I to bring hope and peace and something beautiful in this shattered world. Jeremiah has this to say. For this is what the Lord says. David will have a descendant sitting on the throne of Israel forever. And that is happening right now as Jesus Christ sits on that throne in heaven but as old Isaiah tells us here, oh, one day, one day that throne will be on the earth. And Jesus Christ will reign here on the earth. If you read Revelation, it talks about a millennial reign where Christ reigns on the earth for a thousand years. I don't know if that's human years or heavenly years or what. But one day, Christ will come and he will establish his reign here on the earth. And well, if, you, if, you, if you'll uh, uh, take my little analogy about uh, swimming in brokenness now, then we will be swimming in righteousness. Because God's will will be accomplished on the earth the way it was intended to be from the very beginning. We will be swimming in the righteousness of God. Everything will be changed. It will all be different. It will all be good and holy and right and just and true the way God intended for it to be. And yes, we will swim with the bear. Yes. Many years ago, I was a, a timber buyer in South Alabama, and, and I ran into an a, a elderly gentleman who wore the old bib overalls and all that named Mr. Wiley. I forget his last name, but his first name was Wiley. I remember that part. He was a strong Christian that was a member of the Little Eden Baptist Church there, you know, in a little rural community. And he was also one of those uh, people who had uh, the license from the state of Alabama with the wildlife, the Game and Fish Commission, to take hurt wildlife. You know, that they would bring, the, the game wardens would, would find deer that had been injured or hawks or, or, or bobcats that had been injured and, and brought to them and they would bring him to Mr. Wiley, and he had this fenced-in 
you know, area that he would keep those animals in. He would nurse them back to health until they would, you know, they would be able to go back into the wild. And I sat there on his front porch with him one day, and, and, and he told me, he said, I long for the day when the lion will lie down with the lamb. He said, I love animals so much. I long for that day. And I look forward to being there in Christ's kingdom when it's all made right and all the animals will just eat hay like a cow. Won't that be great? And we're told that, that that's what it will be. Oh. Jesus is the righteous king in the line of David. He will reign here on the earth one day and we are righteous through faith in Him, not through any other means, not by our own doings, but by faith in Christ. And one day we will be swimming in the holiness of God. Nelson Mandela had this to say at an Easter service 20 years ago. The good news born by a risen Messiah who chose not one race, who chose not one country, who chose not one language, who chose not one tribe, who chose all of humankind. He is our Messiah who came to us in the form of a mortal man, but by his, who by his suffering and crucifixion attained immortality. Our Messiah born like an outcast in a stable and executed like a criminal on the cross. Our Messiah, whose life bears testimony to the truth that there is no shame in poverty. Those who should be ashamed are they who impoverish others. Whose life is testifies to the truth that there is no shame in being persecuted. Those who should be ashamed are they who persecute others whose life proclaims the truth that there is no shame in being conquered. Those who should be ashamed are they who conquer others. Whose life testifies to the truth that there is no shame in being dispossessed. Those who should be ashamed are they who dispossess others. Whose life testifies to the truth that there is no shame in being oppressed. Those who should be ashamed are they who oppress others. Each Easter marks the rebirth of our faith. It marks the victory of our risen Savior over the torture of the cross and the grave. Our Savior, who will come again, who will reign, who will establish His kingdom on the earth, who will make all things right, even though they've been broken and, and that brokenness has affected Him most of all. It will all be made right. Do you long for that day? Amen. Do you long for that day when Christ's kingdom will be established? When righteousness will reign? I do. I do. And today, as we await the birth of this Messiah, we also await the kingdom come. It will come when Christ comes through the, crowd, the clouds with a shout and the trumpet blast of the archangel. And all is made right once and for all. Thanks be to God that we have this blessed hope through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you're here today and you've never made a public profession of faith in Christ, you can come and do that today. We're going to stand and sing our closing hymn in just a moment. We'll come on.